Hey y'all, Patrick here with a new episode of Show Me What You Base. This is the series where you guys send in your most beloved, most cherished, most delicate bases, and we just look at them as a community. No matter how expensive, how cheap, how stock, how modded, it doesn't matter. If it's a base, let's look at it. Now I know, it's been, oh, 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 let's, let's, oh man. Yeah, it's been like six, seven months since the last one. My bad, you know how things go sometimes. But, doesn't matter, we're here today, we have some more great bases to look at, so yeah, let's just jump right into it. First up from Patrick, oh, great name by the way. He says, hey Patrick, here's my favorite base, my Chapman MLBD HFF. I know lots of people say, just get a Warwick instead, but there's more to it. It has the same kind of fast neck, lightweight, and ergonomics as an Ibanez sound gear, which is the most comfortable bass to play for me. It's paired with the woods and tone of a Warwick, which are the best sounding basses to me. Add the fan frets and I'm in heaven. It's so easy and natural to play. Love your channel by the way, keep it up, Patrick. Dude, thanks for submitting, man. And yeah, uh, Chapman basses. They are awesome. I played one at NAMM years ago and I absolutely loved it. I don't know why Chapman doesn't keep bases anymore or what the deal is, but they should really bring them back, especially this Dave Hollingworth one, because look at that. Seriously, the fan frets, the tones, the woods, just look at that. <laughs> it looks so good. I don't know, there's something about just the simplicity of it too. It's not just going crazy out there. It's just simply a fan fret base. If you actually play it too, they're super light and the ergonomics, like he said, are absolutely to die for. And then next up from JRM 18010657. That's a, that's a name, I guess. I, I don't know. He says my Aria Pro 2 base. The color is beautiful. HS pickup configuration, absolute bargain for 180 pounds. Love it. No modifications yet. I love the little yet in there. <laughs> oh, that's really cool looking. You don't see a lot of HS configurations like I feel. And I don't think I've ever actually played one myself before, but it seems like it'd be something that would work really well. And especially because of the bridge being a humbucker, would that cancel out the hum or no? I don't really know how math works or how shielding or how wiring or how electronics or how science works. So I don't know, but I just think it would cancel out the hum on that. I don't know, y'all tell me in the comments. <laughs> Then next from Sebastian, he says, this is my go-to base, a Mexican Fender Player Series Jaguar I bought one year ago. I only changed the pit guard, which is originally white, to a white pearly one. Couple with my Microtubes 500, my X7 and Ampeg 610, it has a killer tone. Love from MTL, XOXO. Hugs and kisses to you, man, Mwah. And yeah, uh, Microtubes 500, X7 and a 610 cab, it's gonna be loud. <laughs> Ah, oh, that looks so cool. I love that color too. That's like that sort of sage green looking one, I think. The Pal Ferro is actually super light too on that fretboard and I like that combination. And of course the new pit guard looks snazzy, classy. I like that, man. From Mr. Ivan Gutierrez, he says, this is my favorite base of all time. I saw it for years at the store's webpage and I just imagine how awesome it could be. I like court bases a lot since very few years ago and one day I finally get the chance to buy this one. It had a midnight discount and I bought it in the moment I saw it. It's a pretty solid built sounding bass, passive, active, amazing woods, which give the bass quite a warm and versatile sound. Mixed with the Aguilar and Hipshot components, there's only a few of them, 32 if I'm not wrong, and I'm the proud owner of this. Oh, that is sick looking. Woo! Quartz are so rad, y'all. I mean, I feel like they're more popular in Europe and everywhere outside of America, but if you're in America and you've never tried a quart, definitely try and find a dealer close to you because they are amazing, especially their lower end ones have so much bang for the buck. Oh man, that wood looks absolutely killer. And this one has the SH configuration that I was just saying, there's not a lot of bases that have it, but this doesn't prove anything. <laughs> oh, and not only that, but there's Seymour Duncan bass lines too. Mm, I, I love my Seymour Duncans, what can I say? Yeah, I bet this bass sounds absolutely killer and super thick too, man, love it. Now, before we move on to our next bass, you guys probably noticed, hey, this guy's wearing a hat. He wasn't wearing a hat before. Where did he get that hat? Well, let me tell you where I got this snazzy hat from today's sponsor, Eargasm. So if you've never heard of Eargasm earplugs before, please let me enlighten you. Seriously, they are absolutely incredible. So Eargasm is responsible for making comfortable, durable, discreet, high fidelity earplugs that most importantly, do not muffle sound. Yeah, not like, you know, regular earplugs that just like, I can't hear that. I can't hear anything. What's really awesome about Eargasm's earplugs, y'all, is that they are seriously so comfortable. They are very durable. And it's seriously, they don't muffle the sound at all. You can have a regular conversation or you can go to a concert and enjoy the show still, not just hear. <laughs> yeah, no more of that during concerts. And it is a game changer. <laughs> Since getting these earplugs, I've been to three concerts and all of them have sounded so good. The first one, Co Wetzel. 
fantastic. The second one, Knocked Loose, amazing. Then the third concert was Totally Enormous Extinct Dinosaurs. Yes, I know all these bands are completely different genres of music, but hey, it doesn't matter what genre it is, these earplugs are gonna help you no matter what. So if you just wanna have your normal life and keep going to your favorite activities without worrying about the potential of losing your hearing in the future, definitely try out a pair of Eargasm earplugs, y'all. Go ahead and click the link down in the description and in the pinned comment, and make sure to use the code FUNTER for 10% off your next Eargasm purchase. But y'all, seriously, protecting your hearing is kind of a big deal, especially since we're musicians. So definitely check out Eargasm today because this company does care about your hearing and they wanna make sure that you're comfortable wearing them too. Thank you so much to Eargasm for sponsoring this video. And yeah, let's look at some more basses. All right, next up from Yon. Likilu. Dude, I am so sorry if I just destroyed your name. I'm American. I can barely speak English, but I'm thinking Yon Likilu. That's a really cool name. I I'm sorry if again, if I butchered it, man. This is or was an LTD 30th anniversary model, LTD B500. I named this bass Lucifer because of the band the previous owner played in. I'm not, I can't pronounce that. Valenkenyat. Valenkenyat. Oh, that one's actually not that hard, I feel. Valenkenyat. Valenkenyat. I don't know what I just said, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> the weird thing about this bass is that it's 35 inch scale, but I play it in standard E tuning most of the time. I've replaced a lot of broken parts after buying this. The nut, volume pot, neck pickup, bridge, and two tuners. There was a stupid cartoony looking skull logo on the headstock, so I made it uglier with some stickers. Also, the replacement bridge I put there was weird looking, so I made it look a little smaller with some black tape. I've thought of actually cutting it smaller one day. I haven't tried out many other basses, but I think it plays well. At least it's good enough for me. It's ugly, but I play in thrash metal bands, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I love that. Oh, it's one of those LTDs. Okay. Man, is that like a flat black finish too? Okay, it's a set neck on the back too. I love that curve so you can reach those higher frets. Man, that looks rad. Oh, that is a humongous bridge. You were not kidding. Nothing's holding it in like screws at the top. You should be able to like cut that and you'd be perfectly fine, right? From Blake Mickens, he says, this bass was my first and it was some off-brand Chinese P-Bass knockoff. Since I got it, I upgraded pretty much every piece of it except for the bridge and it sounds amazing. It has replacement fender tuners, Warmoth neck, Seymour Duncan SB3 pickup, good stuff, man. And a new set of electronics. This bass is my most important bass just because of the amount of time I've put into it and all the awesome memories I've gotten out of it. It's been the bass that I play for almost every show and I'm honestly surprised it's not more beat up. Dude, that is wicked. I love hearing things like that. Oh, come on. That is just classy looking. It's one of those things too where it's just like, cool, you replaced the pieces that you felt needed to be replaced and you love playing it. That's what matters. Does it matter that it's an off-brand P-Bass knockoff? No, who cares? That's just awesome. Next from Lloyd, he says, hey, I thought I'd share my bass. It's a Dan Electro 63 reissue. I played a few basses before, but nothing feels as good as this one. The pickups have a certain growl to them that fenders just don't give. If you crank the bridge pickup all the way and the neck one off, it sounds a lot like a Hoffner viola bass, so you can get that real Beatles-y sound. One of the pots is missing and it's been through some shit, but it plays beautifully. I super glued a Lego brick onto it for a thumb rest too. Thanks, Lloyd. Huh, that is really cool looking. Oh, that is so like weird looking, but so rad at the same time. That's one of those that I would keep just to specifically only play like a bunch of fuzz pedals through. And that's it. <laughs> that's so cool looking. Also, I don't get Let's Start a Bakery, but I like it. And those tuners too, do they hold in tune? If you have one of these like Dan Electros that have those really small tuners, do they really hold like good in tune or do you get just replacement tuners eventually? Because they look like guitar tuners, which is fine. The look is fine, but I'm just concerned like, how do they hold up? But either way, that's an awesome bass. It's like that flat black with the chrome on it too, with the stickers on it. It's just so, and of course, you put a Lego piece on there as a thumb rest by Super Gluing, which is just, I love that in so many ways. <laughs> Next up from Rick S, he says, Hey Patrick, here's my main five string bass I use for shows. It's a BC Rich Paolo Gregoletto signature bass five, white body and neck with black binding on neck and body, black hardware, 35 inch scale, basswood body, bolt on maple neck, BC Rich Diecast Tuners, 24 fret ebony fretboard, reverse stealth headstock, active electronics, EMG 40 DC pickups, two volume and two tone, strung with GHS bass boomers, 5M LDYB. Oh, that's a mouthful right there. Five string medium light strings, custom logo paint job by Joey Goddard in Sacramento, California. Love your channel. Keep up the good work. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. I love Trivium. If you don't know, Paolo is the basis for Trivium, has been the basis for Trivium for a long ass time. And Trivium is one of those modern metal bands that just consistently album after album keeps putting out bangers left and right. 
Each album is incredible. Paolo himself is an amazing bassist, such an incredible inspiration, especially because he doesn't use a pick. He always uses his fingers. He's singing at the same time, dancing around. It is incredible. I actually got to meet him at NAMM the other year, and he was a super kind guy too. But ah, I'm not a fan of this BC Rich. It's really cool that he got a signature BC Rich. I think if any artist gets a signature guitar of any kind, that is just the coolest thing ever to me. Uh, and he used this one for years. I think now he uses Kiesel's and uh, Warwick's, I want to say. But man, BC Riches, just they're not my thing. But I will say, because of that all white, the matching headstock, that black binding too with the soap bar pickups, looks pretty good. Looks pretty good in my opinion. Oh, and you're just having a blast with it. Come on, I can't be mad at that, man. That's so sick. <laughs> Next up from Lake Wharton, they say this is Shory Waller, my Franken Fender Precision Bass. The name has a long story, don't feel like explaining it here. I respect that, and that's also a really cool name. This bass started life as an off-white 94 Squire Affinity P bass my mom bought in a pawn shop in 2003, and has been upgraded, modified, and repainted countless times. It has mostly American Fender parts now, and it all started after my friend bought me 51 reissue tuners to replace the stock ones after it fell out of his truck. Your bass fell out of his truck? And it's doing okay? Hey! That's awesome. And also that's really nice of him to buy replacement tuners. A friend of my stepdad's gave it its current paint job as a high school graduation present. This is my only bass, my ride or die bass, the bass I will pass on to my daughters when I die. Dude, that is so sick. Oh, that is cool. That's such a weird and wicked paint job. I love like the Rel King 2 as part of it. The gold pit guard. Oh, and the back looks so sick. That's awesome. From Ragnar V, he says, hey, I'm sorry I cannot choose between these two. Well, I'm sorry because I'm going to choose between these two. Uh, Warwick Corvette and a Harley Benton. Uh, the Harley Benton's a six string, so I'm going to go with the six string. I know. Hey, that's one of the rules of show me what you bass. If you send me two basses, I'm going to choose just one. Harley Benton six string is the one I jam alone and even perform with. I won't play a band with it. Too many strings. I feel that. The extended range comes in handy in those situations. Love it all the way. Love the shape, the natural dark wood texture bright stripes in between matte finish the crystal clear metallic deep punchy sound different to warwick though this one is with a preamp and i carry a bunch of batteries with this one just in case if you insist featuring only one then it has to be the harley benton well it's a good thing i already did the harley benton <laughs> it's the one i've spent more time with and i started out with love your videos keep at it stay safe and healthy much love from estonia ragnar dude thank you so much and to all of you as well i hope you're staying safe hope you're staying healthy and i hope you're playing a lot of bass too dang look at this thing <laughs> Oh my god, it looks like a monster, but a beautiful monster. The only reason I'm calling it a monster is just because it needs two trust rods and it just looks humongous. I've also never played a six string bass before, but man, look at that thing. I bet you can get some wicked tones with it. And yeah, that wood looks absolutely gorgeous. Now from Joe Bass, they say, hi, Patrick. This is my Squire vintage modified jazz bass. I removed the lacquer finish and put some wood paint with a lot of sanding. With Fender Custom Shop 60s pickups, Wilkinson Black Hardware, and TI Flats is my favorite bass. Ooh, that looks good. So you said you removed the lacquer finish, put some wood paint. It looks like you kind of burned it. That's so cool looking. And I think with how dark everything is on the body, having that light maple neck just looks so slick in my opinion. Man, with the black hardware too, that's good. That's really cool. From Jordan Dane, he says, hey Patrick, please find and close pictures of my modified Shine by Chase Telecaster Electric Bass Guitar SBA 714. That's a mouthful right there. Now here's where things get wild. It's set up to use the Architects G-Sharp octave tuning. What? Oh man, we're doing this. So G-Sharp, G-Sharp, C-Sharp, F-Sharp with a monster 0.175 on the low G-Sharp. Whoa, that is, that's a thick gauge of string, y'all. I mean, for reference, uh, what I use are 110s and 105s for my lowest string. So a 175, yeah, that's pretty thick to say the least. Uh, a 105 for the G sharp above that. So yeah, a standard string as the second string. Then 70 for the C sharp and 50 for the F sharp. Setup was a nightmare for this. And the lower G supposedly can hold down a low F sharp on a 34 inch scale. Oh, that's, wouldn't that be super flubby though? Anyway, but I always find it bouncing out of tune. Yeah, uh, that's so low as it is. Likely this is my fault, I'm being too rough. Luckily for me though, my tech is Jack Dutton, formerly of Parting Gift and Lotus Eater, the latter of which I think you'd really like. Cool, I'll check him out. All the best, I really look forward to seeing what everyone else watches your channel has in store. You're sincerely, Jordan. Thanks, man. Uh, oh, another SH. Oh man, I am just a liar <laughs> this entire episode so far. <laughs> that's a really rad looking tele base though. I love the bridge on it. Is that like that sort of like Warwick configuration? And the fact that you have it tuned 
so low. I just, I want to hear what this sounds like. I'm just so afraid to have a bass tuned that low because of how it's just going to sound. I'm afraid with the tuning that low, it would just flub, flub, flub. And that would like all, like there'd be no like character to it, no presence at all. That's what I'm worried about if I did something like that. But if you were able to set it up to where it actually makes a good amount of decent noise that you're looking for, then yes, absolutely. That is killer. I'm just so afraid myself to have a, I'm assuming that's a regular 34 inch scale bass with a tuning that low, just because of, again, flub, flub. from Rasmus, he says, Hey Patrick, Rasmus from Denmark here. This is my Warwick Corvette double buck five string. I've had it for around five years and I bought it pre-owned. The previous owner wanted 800 bucks for it, but I ended up buying it for 700 and a case of beer. That is a deal right there. That's how you haggle. <laughs> I think I hit his weak spot. <laughs> This bass has followed me through rock gigs, pop gigs, folk gigs, and metal gigs. It has never failed me or let me down. And the reason why this is the bass I'm taking to the grave is that it's the first bass I have ever played in my nine years of bass playing, which I felt comfortable playing from the first time playing it. My other basses I had to get a little used to, and thanks to review, I bought the Dark Glass Microtubes X Ultra, which fits the bass perfectly for my metal tone. Best regards, Rasmus in Denmark. Dude, thanks, man. And yeah, uh, that's awesome that it's one of those things where like from the get-go, you play a bass and you just go, yeah, this is it. That's so killer. Ooh, yeah, that's a double buck. Man, Warwicks just look so good. And they have that very signature tone to them. And don't ask me why I haven't had a Warwick really on the channel yet. I think I tried years ago. Uh, Warwick never hit me back up or anything like that. Uh, but maybe in the future, we can go ahead and get some Warwicks on here. Let me know what Warwick specifically you guys would like to see. But man, uh, it's so sick looking, dude. From Moody's Music, they say, hey, Patrick. This is my 2008 Schecter Stiletto Elite. This was my first big bass purchase once I moved out of my parents' house. I later added a collar and I'm just as in love with this bass as I was 12 years ago. Ride or die. Man, look at that top. That's so sick. Uh, so is that like black, purple, that like quilt on it too? Oh, that bridge. Man, I've never played with a collar trim before. I've never played a tremolo system of any kind on a bass. I don't know how I would feel about it. They look so foreign to me, but I'm sure they're a blast to play around with. Oh, with those EMGs, that bridge, I know that Schechter has to play incredibly good. From Cone Nos, they say this Aria Pro 2 Mad Axe bass is made of a plywood body, but it has a really thin and great neck and the pickups sound amazing. I prefer this one over my Ibanez GRS 205. Okay, so we got this bright red PJ bass. That neck does look like it could be super thin, maybe as thin as the Ivan as you were talking about too. That's some cool stickers you got there. I can't even tell what that sticker is either. Huh? I don't know. That's rad, man. It's a bright color too. I actually don't have any, many at all red bases, I think. Huh, maybe I should change that. From Ian the Basis, they say, hey, Dear Patrick, here are pictures of my bass in response to your YouTube video. It's a Hofner Ignition Series violin bass, the cheap made in the Philippines version of the 501. This bass is my first bass ever, and I got it two years ago. I haven't done much to it, but I love the sound as is. If I want a different sound, I have a couple pedals that work great. I mainly just play it in my church's band, though I've been branching out by learning music I actually like, such as Oversized by Basement. Basement, so good. Everlong by the Foo Fighters, and Thought Contagion by Muse. All those are fantastic. I've been writing some music of my own and have a long summer with not much else to do coming up, so I'm excited to finally play the kind of music I really want to play with it. Maybe record a little something too. Sincerely, Ian. Oh man, yeah. I will never deny like the classic stylings of Hofners. I don't even think I've ever played a regular Hofner bass by itself. But it's just, you look at it and you're like, damn, that's classy, that's classic looking. So, hell yeah, man. From Barnabas, he says, hey Hunter, saw your video about wanting to see other people's basses. Well, here's mine. It's nothing special. It's a no-name Japanese-made neck-through bass with active EQ that I got off of eBay. Klein and Zendengen. Sorry to all my German fans who just had to hear me say eBay. Klein and Zingen. Perfect. It has two humbuckers, no idea what brand they are, but it sounds amazing. Before this one, I had a cheapo court bass, which got the job done, but I didn't like it that much. When I went to check this bass out, I was honestly very nervous. I had no idea how it sounded, and I ran the risk of buying a totally shit bass. But when I plugged it in and played it, I was satisfied. Sound like just how I imagined. Down the line, it got a bit annoying. Due to the cheap price, it had some fret sprouts, so I had to have them filed. That was extra on the already high price for me. But after all the headaches, it was ready to go. It isn't the best, of course. It's heavy as an anchor. The nut is a bit weird. I can't intonate the G perfectly, and so on and so on. But I like it this way. It's perfect for me this way. Oh, and it has coral split. I only found out about it after a month or so. 
But yeah, this is my base. Hope you enjoy Barnabas. Dude, thanks, man. Oh, that's so wicked looking. They're definitely going for like that court aesthetic with this base. Are those hip shot branded actually like tuners too? Oh, they're Grover tuners. Sick. It's a neck through construction too. Heck, I bet if you get like a professional setup on it, that should hopefully, I say should because I don't know, obviously, hopefully help with the intonation problems you're having overall. And I just highly suggest that if you can't do a setup yourself, no matter who you are, uh, definitely get a professional setup done because it makes a world of difference. From Enrico, he says, hey, Patrick, I like the idea of featuring our instruments and videos. This is my first bass ever, C.A.R. Squire Jazz Bass. I got it when I was 16, and even though I bought and traded some basses during the years, I promised myself this would never leave me as it's the one that started my experience as a player. The only mods are passive Bartolini pickups, strap locks, black pick guard that doesn't fit perfectly. Eh, it's okay, instead of the original white one. Best wishes, Enrico from Italy. Dude, thank you so much, man. Oh, yeah, that's sick. Again, another cool red bass. Oh, I see where you talk about the pick guard not fitting. Eh, it's fine. It's not a big deal. I bet those Bartolini sound so good, too. I actually don't have any experience with Bartolini single coil pickups. Only their regular active, like, soap bars that I do not care for. But I wonder if the Bartolini single coils, like the passive ones, would actually, you know, be good to me. Hmm. I wonder. Next up from Andrew Edwards. He says, hey, Patrick, love your work. Bit of information on my go-to bass. It was originally an Epiphone Ripper bass soap bar edition. Love the sound on it, but always wanted a Gibson Ripper for a decent one. They come with a hefty price tag. Yes, they do. So I decided to pimp my Epiphone. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Started with the bridge, fitting a hip shot super tone bridge. Then after a lot of eBaying, I came across the electronics and scratch plate off a 75 Ripper bass. I put my maximum bid in and forgot about it. A few days later, I won it and there was no going back. I then contacted Seymour Duncan to order a set of custom Ripper pickups and the rest is history. Got a luthier to make me a new scratch plate using the original electronics and pots. Old one didn't fit and fitted the pickups after a bit of routing. Cheers from Eddie. Oh yeah, come on. That new bridge alone is completely worth it. That looks so good. But I love how you actually took this and said, hey, I'm gonna actually turn this into a Ripper. That's so cool. Next up from the family says, hi, Patrick. I have a number of bases, including a fretless cigar box base and a Spectre, which come close, but I would have to say that my favorite base is probably my cheapest. I already love this. I saw a base on eBay from a seller called Santa Maria Guitars in Germany, and I love this seriously road warden look, and I had been looking for a cheapy jazz style base. I think it paid about 200 pounds shipped to get it to the UK, and it played great. The only changes I made are new pickups, which are Allen Entwistle JBX Neodymium pickups, which are some of the best pups I've ever used and a great value for money. It's also rocking Jerry only gauge strings and is my go-to base for any project or gig. Thanks, Nathaniel. Dude, thanks, man. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay, this one definitely had some fire involved in it. That's so rad though. That's a cool looking strap too. I love that. If it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it was cheap, but it plays great. I have a perfect sounding pair of pickups in it. And I love the strings, the setup, everything about it. Yeah, I could totally understand why this would be your favorite bass. Next up from Fabian, he says, hey dude, my name is Fabian and this is my Yamaha TRBX174EW. Rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? It sure does. <laughs> in Tobacco Brown Sunburst. The second bass I've owned and the first one I bought new. My first bass being a used GSR 200 that to be honest, was bad, very bad. I saw this bass in the store near where I work and just liked how it looked and sounded Plus, it was pretty cheap. It was not until I got my Epiphone that you could see on the background that I realized I like brown instruments. Thanks for reading and good luck from Mexico. Dude, cheers from Texas, man. Oh, yeah. Yamaha's like, they're so weird looking in so many different ways, but this is rad. I love that color, too. That's a really nice sunburst. It's such a weird looking shape. I love that headstock shape, though. And I've heard nothing but good things about just Yamaha bases in general. Ah, it's so cool. And for our very last bass today from Mr. Tim Black, he just says it's from the early 2000s. It's really loud. Six pickups, Harlequin prismatic paint. Whoa, that's an old carbon. Whoa, that's a lot to take in. It's like the galaxy finish. The SH pickup configuration. I, I, okay, I'll just say it. I was a liar earlier by saying there's not enough SH pickup configurations because apparently that's the theme for today. <laughs> Man, so you said six pickups. Do you mean six pickup configurations? Because that's a lot. I just, I guess because I'm assuming it's active. I have no idea. There's six knobs and what looks like a three-way switch. That might be a three-way. That might be like a five-way. I don't even, that's crazy looking. I wonder what different combinations you can get. I cannot get over that finish at all. The headstock is very like Gibson grabber. So I love that. 24 frets. I, that finish. I want to know what this sounds like though, <laughs> but it's so cool. 
But that is it today for episode 12 of Show Me What You Base. And y'all, thank you so much for watching as always. Thanks for watching, subscribing, for following me on social media, for sharing all this stuff. I truly do appreciate it. And for sending in your bases too. And of course, thank you so much for your patience as well. I know I've fallen behind on all this, but you know, life gets in the way. Other videos get in the way, and this is a lot to edit, but I truly do appreciate you guys sending in your bases. I'm just now on submissions from May 15th of 2020. It is now May of 2022. <laughs> so there's gonna be plenty more content. I just have to get back in the rhythm of making it again. But y'all, thank you so much for watching today. And y'all, if you wanna submit your ride or die instrument, for a future installment of Show Me What You Base, go ahead and send an email to showmewhatyoubase at gmail.com with a brief description, at least three pictures, please. And of course, just one base, just one base. There's enough as there is, but hey, thank you all again so much for watching. A humongous thank you to my Patreon supporters. Mm, you just look how beautiful they are today. Mwah. If you wanna be like one of these gorgeous people right here and help support the channel every single month, be including things like early access to videos, giveaways, and more, then go ahead and head on over to my Patreon page. But y'all, again, thank you so much for watching. Humongous thank you to Eargasm for sponsoring today's video. And of course, no matter where in the world you are, stay safe, practice that bass, and I'll see y'all next time. <laughs>